All right, Ezra Nehemiah, let us rise up and build. This is lesson number six in the, uh, in the series. When ordinary men do extraordinary work, it's part one. So this title of my lesson today, When Ordinary Men Do Extraordinary Work, is a study of Nehemiah's efforts at rebuilding the defensive wall around uh, uh, Jerusalem. And uh, the outline for this particular lesson, a great book by Alan Redpath, I highly recommend it, Victorious Christian Service, Alan Redpath, great book, lots of, uh, lots of information, uh, worthwhile information in that particular book. Um, I think a more exact title would be when ordinary people do extraordinary work because the Bible is filled with examples of men and women, old and young, from different cultures, who despite their ordinariness, manage to do great things. For example, uh, Abraham, I mean, who was Abraham? He was nobody, he was a guy who lived in Ur. No great family, wasn't wealthy, wasn't anything. He was a person that God chose to do something with him. An ordinary man called to do extraordinary things. Or Moses, the uh, disgraced orphan son of a queen who had killed somebody and was hiding out in the desert, yet God found him and gave him a great task. David, the least of Jesse's eight sons, not the eldest, the least, the youngest, the least of which, uh, you know, uh, Samuel had said, don't you have any other sons? Oh, wait a minute, yeah, we've got the young guy, he's out taking care of the sheep, you know, if you want to see him. And that's the one that God wanted. And then of course, Esther, who was she? Yes, she, she had beauty, but I mean, who was she? She was an adopted child of a man who was living in exile. No position, no status, nothing. Just happened to have the gift of physical beauty. And yet God chose her to do a, a great thing. So it seems that God has a fondness for those who are small in the eyes of men, those who are not considered great, even by the standards of this fallen world, and yet God chooses them to exercise his will and purpose through their small lives in order to, uh, in order to bring honor and glory to himself and to bless with extraordinariness the lives of ordinary people. In other words, God uses small things to do big things. And so it was with Nehemiah, that's the the preamble, and so it was with uh, Nehemiah. Oh yes, uh, it says he was a cup bearer to the king, wine taster to protect against poisoning the king. He would taste the wine ahead of time, he was a guinea pig, and he served the king. He had proximity to the king, uh, probably served as a type of a counselor. Uh, perhaps this had a measure of importance in that world, but the reality of the situation was that he was, an he was enslaved, he was really a slave, part of the exiles who had been removed from Judah by the Babylonian army after the destruction of uh, Jerusalem. So he was a slave twice over. Some scholars believe that he may have even been a eunuch because there is no mention of his family and uh, the easy proximity that he had to the king. They didn't let just anybody next to the king. Uh, many times uh, these individuals who were counselors were also eunuchs. But his story demonstrates so well how God can use a powerless, yes, even damaged people to do great things uh, in his name. In addition to this, and what's more pertinent for us today, Nehemiah's experience teaches us what to expect from God when he calls on us to rise beyond our ordinary circumstances and build something in his name. When God calls you to do something, 
He also provides what you need in order to do the thing that he's called you to do, whatever that is. So in our lesson today, we're going to retrace some of the material we've already covered in order to go more deeply into uh, Nehemiah's experience. Let's talk a little bit about Nehemiah's background before we begin. I want to summarize some of what we've been studying about this uh, period. First of all, we know that the Jewish people had been taken into Babylonia, Babylonian uh, captivity for 70 years, according to Jeremiah's prophecy. And then in approximately 538 BC, the power of the Babylonian Empire was broken by Persia. And upon assuming supremacy, the king of Persia encouraged the Jewish remnant to return to their own country. Some 50, I'm rounding it off here, but some 50,000 people did return. And they set about the immense task of rebuilding their city and their temple which was the center of Jewish life. Remember, something that they thought was impossible, it wouldn't happen, they were enslaved, they were small, they had no power, they have no arm, no, no leader, no money, no nothing. They would have never thought that the pagan king himself would be the one to say, you know what, you guys, I want you to go back home. I want you to rebuild your city. Here's some money, here's the, the materials you need. Uh, rebuild that temple that you had, that, we, that the Babylonians tore. Nobody, nobody had a thought about that. The prophets perhaps, none of the people thought. This was a, nothing less than a miracle in their eyes. They faced of course opposition from their neighbors when they got there and they started rebuilding. After they laid a foundation, they were forced to stop building the temple, we talked about that. And it lay unfinished for almost 20 years, not a couple of weeks or a couple of months, two decades. It just sat there unfinished until God raised up prophets to encourage the people to themselves raise up and finish the building of the temple and reinstate the worship of the temple. And what's interesting is we read about it before, we talked about it before, the prophets that he raised up were young men that had kind of gone back to Jerusalem with their parents and they grew up you know, during this 20 year period and God then called on those prophets to speak out. He waited, he waited two decades before raising up a couple of prophets who would then speak to the people and encourage them to start the task that they had uh, left alone for 20 uh, long years. So 60 more years passed and another group of exiles returned, this time with Ezra, the priest. This man who could trace his priestly lineage back to Aaron, set about reestablishing the moral and the spiritual life of the people that had fallen into a neglected state. You see, it wasn't just rebuilding the building where the worship would take place. It was also rebuilding the people, uh, teaching them all over again uh, how to worship, what to do, the laws, the requirements of being a faithful uh, a Jewish uh, uh, believer. And so in 445 BC, 12 years after Ezra had returned to Jerusalem to minister to the people, God raised up another servant to match the need of the hour. And it's at this point that God calls on Nehemiah to come and to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. So they had rebuilt the, the altar, they rebuilt the temple, they had rebuilt many of their homes and so on and so forth, but the wall around Jerusalem still lay in ruins. And during that period of time, a, a significant city needed a wall for protection against bandits, uh, bandits against uh, marauding groups that would go through to you know, set fire and pillage and so on and so forth. So it was a very important part of, uh, of their life and of their city uh, protection. And so Nehemiah lived and served in the court of the Persian king, uh, Artaxerxes uh, I. He obtained permission and the supplies from the king in order to return to Jerusalem 
and begin rebuilding its protective wall and the gates to enable people to come in and out of the city. So we read in his book, in the book of Nehemiah, that he encountered much opposition from the enemies of the Jews, but that in a remarkably short time, the wall was rebuilt. The rest of his memoir recounts how he had to return to the city later on in order to reinstate religious order among the leaders and the people. We talked about that last week, maintenance work, right? Maintenance work, He's, everything was set up, the temple was set up, people were taught, the worship started, you know, normal life began uh, many, several years go by and what happens? People, you know, they fall back, they backslide, they, they stop going to worship, they stop supporting the, 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 the priests in the temple and so, uh, uh, Nehemiah had to come back and he had to reinstate the rules. In other words, they had to do maintenance work, maintenance work, maintenance work on, the, uh, on the people. So in studying Nehemiah's calling, we can learn much about the way that God's servants respond and work once they are called. So this part of the lesson is called cupbearer to fortress builder. Um, Please open your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter one, and let's see how one goes from being an enslaved cupbearer to becoming a successful fortress builder. It says the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year while I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem, which is normal. You know, people come back from the city, from, from the old country, you know, from Judah and the city and they, they've rebuilt the wall, uh, not the walls, they've rebuilt the temple and life has gone back to some sort of normalcy and they come back and they come and see him. The first thing he's going to ask is, how are things going? How's the, you know, uh, the city, is it going well? And uh, so we find out in verse three, it says, they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So Nehemiah's brother and others visit him with news of uh, home. The uh, problem of the broken walls and burned gates was twofold. First, it was a safety issue. They were quite vulnerable to attack from their unfriendly neighbors, as well as, as I mentioned before, roaming uh, gang of, uh, gangs of bandits and thieves. And then there was a second issue, and it was a uh, honor issue. It was an honor issue. Their city and their society were ashamed because of the condition of their wall. The very first thing that people saw when they approached the city. You know, what, what kind of impression would they have uh, as they approached the great city of Jerusalem uh, if the first thing they see are burnt out gates and walls that are knocked down and so on and so forth, you know, rubble. Uh, so they were ashamed because it was a reflection on themselves. In verse four, it says, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So Nehemiah is touched by this report. The conditions of the wall symbolizes the discouragement and the fear of the people. In other words, they were as broken as the wall was. The wall was broken and the people were broken. You know, it says the ones who survived the captivity, imagine they made it through the captivity being dragged out of their houses and seeing their neighbors killed and everything burnt and dragged off to a, a foreign land and survived that and you know, uh, settled there for decades, you know, and now uh, they, they managed to go back to their, uh, <laughs> to their homeland and uh, more trouble. Uh, pretty discouraging time uh, for them. And so he is so troubled uh, by this news that he goes to God in fasting and prayer. We learn later that in his prayers, he is asking God, what can be done about this situation? A little further down in verse 10, 
it says in his prayer, he acknowledges that the condition of the wall and of the people are due to their sins and disobedience. He acknowledges right off the bat, oh Lord, uh, you know, I know why this has happened. You know, sin is the reason that we were destroyed and carried off in the first place. And sin is the reason why nothing is being done you know, back, back home. Uh, the sin of laziness or fear or whatever, or loss of faith. And so in his prayer, he acknowledges that the condition of the wall and of the people are due to their sins and their disobedience. He also appeals to God to fulfill his promise to bless and restore his uh, people. So a little further down in verse 11, it says, O Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. So uh, at the end of the prayer, we see that Nehemiah has a specific request in mind. There's something that he wants to do to resolve the problem, but he needs God's help in order uh, to do this. Uh, it says at the end of uh, verse 11, I haven't got it down here, it says, now I was the cupbearer to the king uh, in verse 11. And so we're not sure what this is until the very last line where he mentions what his role is. You know, he, want, he wants success before this man. And then he says, I was the cupbearer to the king. So this man is who? Well, it's the king. That's his, that's his prayer. Now in normal circumstances, one would put this information at the very beginning to describe who the author is and his position. But Nehemiah places his cupbearer position right in this position in order to establish his priorities. He's a Jew, first and foremost, he's a Jew. Then he's a cupbearer. that's his present position. This is how his priorities lie for his life and for his identity. He also uses this construction to reveal what his ultimate plan is, and that is he's going to appeal to the king for help. So he's asking God to turn the king's heart towards him in a favorable way. So we go to chapter two and we continue reading. It says, and it came about in the month of Nisan in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. So the king said to me, why is your face sad though you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire? Then the king said to me, what would you request? So I prayed to the God of uh, heaven. I, I want you to note that there were four long months that passed by between you know, uh, uh, Nehemiah making his prayer you know, or rather uh, receiving the news of you know, the destruction of the walls and so on and so forth and him making his prayer and this particular moment, four months go by. In the meantime, he has continued in his usual duties before the king. Nehemiah has probably continued to pray and by this time he's beginning to wonder if God has really called him or if his prayers have actually been in vain. You know, we pray about stuff for a day or two or three, a week, two weeks, a month goes by, two months, three months, four months, nothing. You start to wonder, you know, is, you know, is God listening? It seems that the stress and the anxiety of this situation has begun to show on his face. Now we need to understand that Nehemiah wasn't acting sad in order to get the king's attention. He, he wasn't trying to make something happen. You know, being sad or engrossed in your own problems or distracted while you were in the presence of the king was a capital offense. Life was cheap in those days. Life was very cheap. You know, cup bearers were expendable. <laughs> the very nature of your service. 
uh, you were expendable. So you, you needed to be cheerful uh, you know, and attentive to the king and what his business was, not your own, uh, not your own affair. And so you know, the, king, the king was not Oprah, it wasn't Dr. Phil. You know, he didn't care about your situation. He only cared about his situation. So Nehemiah had good reason to be afraid. That's why he said he was afraid. Instead of the subject coming up during a discussion of politics or in some normal way, which I would imagine Nehemiah was waiting for, perhaps there'll be a discussion about what's going on in the provinces or have we received tax money from uh, the area of Judah or something like that, where he could kind of slip in a word and say, oh, by the way, since you we're talking about Judah, did you know, and so on and so forth. But that opportunity uh, did, not, uh, did not come up. And so instead of the, as I say, instead of the subject coming up in a normal way, the king now asks him a personal question and he was being forced to respond. Nehemiah therefore tells the truth. I mean, if you're going to die, you might as well tell the truth. And so he reveals the condition of his city, that that is the thing that is distressing him. And the king, if we continue to read, responds by allowing Nehemiah to make a request of him. Note, before Nehemiah does this, he makes another prayer. He prays again to God. Nehemiah was not allowed to approach the king, but God was allowed to approach the king. And he did so on Nehemiah's behalf, and he answered his prayer at the proper time. And so in verses five to 10, Nehemiah requests permission to return to Jerusalem to personally supervise the rebuilding of the walls. He also asks for royal permission to travel with protection and letters to the governors of these areas uh, authorizing his uh, work because he knew that uh, there, there would be uh, opposition. Now to top it all off, he requests that the king provide the materials for the project. Not only the permission to go, not only protection for his, himself and his party, but also the resources to do the construction job. And the king agrees. He agrees and he sends him on his way with the condition that he returns in a certain amount of time. After all, Nehemiah was a, he was a slave. He wasn't giving him his freedom. He was letting him go to do a project for a time. So once Nehemiah arrives in Jerusalem, he's greeted by neighboring leaders who question his mission and they begin immediately to oppose him. And we read in verses 11 to 16 that once he's in Jerusalem, he quietly surveys the work that needs to be done. He goes at night and he rides around the wall to see how much work there is. I say quietly or secretly because he does not want to provoke an attack from his enemies or opposition from the people before he has a chance to speak to them. He knows what happened when, they first, when the first group went back and they started to rebuild the altar and the temple and all that, all the opposition. So he knows about that. He wants to make sure to avoid that type of thing. In verses 17 to 20, we'll pick up the reading. It says, then I said to them, you see the bad situation we are in, now he's speaking to the people, he's, he's, he's done his survey work. He says, you see the bad situation we are in, that Jerusalem is desolate and its gates burned by fire? Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words which had uh, spoken to me. Then they said, let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. But when Sanballat the uh, Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard it, they mocked us and despised us and said, what is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build, but you have no portion, right or memorial in Jerusalem. So note in this passage, Nehemiah's method of inspiring his followers. Very first thing he does is he shares the vision. He shares the vision. They who live next to the ruined walls they were too close, they were too burned out to see the situation 
clearly. You know, sometimes you just, it's right in front of you and you don't see it because you're living with it every day, whatever that is. Sometimes it's a physical ailment, sometimes it's, uh, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, it, the furnace is broken, the car doesn't work, you know, you, you're working around it, but you don't see the, the problem. So Nehemiah conveys the true meaning of what has happened. They are a reproach. In other words, for a reproach, they're a disgrace. He says, we're a disgrace in the eyes of others because of the condition of the wall around our, around our city. The wall's condition reflected the people's condition. And it was a shameful thing for God's people to be this way. You're God's people. This is God's city. This is God's temple. And you've allowed the, the condition of the wall to remain in this situation that it is. And so most time, you know, people don't see themselves. They're so used to their weaknesses or their sins or their reproaches that they just ignore them and they learn to live with them. Nehemiah's vision was not of the future. He wasn't a prophet. His was a clear vision of what was actually happening now. A lot of times in the church today, you know, we have the Bible uh, it does the work of the prophet. You know, the Bible speaks for God. But the leaders in the church, they're the ones that need to have the vision, either the vision of what needs to happen today or what needs to happen tomorrow or in five years from now. But the vision has to be articulated clearly to the people and that's what Nehemiah uh, was doing. His vision, as I say, was not of the future. His clear vision was what was actually happening now. And he said to them, you're a disgrace because of the situation of the wall. He doesn't berate the people. He doesn't rebuke them. He simply shares the clarity of his vision and he offers the natural solution. And the solution is, let's rebuild. This is the problem. We're considered a, a disgrace because of it. Here's the solution. Let's rebuild. Let's fix the problem. Now people are more likely to respond to an action plan for fixing a problem than continual harping or complaining about the problem at hand. You know, the first step is you have to articulate the vision. Let other people see what you see. The second step in Nehemiah's method to inspire the people, he provides motivation. Now, if he were a modern motivational speaker, you know, if he was Dr. Phil or uh, what's his name, uh, Robbins, uh, he would have said things like, well, let's just do it. Let's get in there. Uh, you know, anything your heart says, uh, anything your heart thinks you can, you can do. Believe in yourself and all things are possible. Uh, buy these tapes and buy these books and uh, you know, listen to my seminar <laughs> and you'll be able to do anything. You know, that's, that's the usual way. But of course, Nehemiah didn't do any of these. He was God's servant and God's servants are motivated by God, not themselves, not other men. Why do this, Nehemiah asked. Well, do this because there is, this is no ordinary wall, this is God's wall. Why do this, Nehemiah asks. Because this is no ordinary work, this is God's work. Why do this, Nehemiah asked. Because you are not just ordinary people, you are God's people. When it comes to building anything for God, let's remember that it's the spirit of God that moves men to action, not slogans, not surveys. And then finally, third, Nehemiah provided a response to opposition. Because remember I said the first, thing, the first thing that happens is always the vision. I see the end, I see what could be, whatever that is, right? That's, that's always the first step. And then the second step is what? Opposition, right? Pushback. Somebody says, nah, that, we'll never do that. that. That costs way too much money. We tried that, you know, seven years ago and it never worked. 
uh, this is too small a group. Uh, we don't have the, you know what I'm saying? Opposition, opposition, it's always the same. No matter where, if you work for a company or a teacher, uh, whenever you have a great idea for something, there's always somebody coming along to, to push back. Uh, the, the secret is to, to expect it, to know that it's coming. Remember a few lessons back, I said that any project has stages. Stage one's the beginning, stage two is always the obstacles. Godly vision and motivation are no guarantee that there will be no obstacles. Just because what we want to do or what one person wants to do is for God doesn't mean that there won't be oppositions. On the contrary, you can be sure there'll be opposition if it's something for God. Godly vision and motivation guarantee that it will receive opposition from the evil one. In every generation, Satan opposes the people and the plans of God, especially when they are motivated to put those plans into action. So long as we're not doing anything, well, Satan's not going to rise up. Why should he? But the moment we decide to actually do something, take a risk, take a step of faith, that's when he'll show his ugly face and oppose us. Once the people rose up to build, the opposition was immediate and could have killed their movement before it began. The threat was that their enemies would report them to the king as being uh, in rebellion. You know, if you build this wall, we're going to report you to the king, you're causing trouble. Or uh, that was the play, you know, in the past that shut down the rebuilding of the uh, temple for 20 years. They say, you rebuild that temple, that means you, know, you want the God of the Jews to rise up again and that'll lead to insurrection. You'll try to dominate the people around you. You'll stop paying taxes. And they, they, wrote, they, they wrote that letter to the king and the king just shut everything down. They didn't even respond. But it didn't work this time because Nehemiah had a ready answer. I go back to verse 20. So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven, will give us success. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no portion or right or memorial in Jerusalem. Notice that he doesn't rely on his decree from the king or letters to the governors giving him permission, although he could have done that. Notice that he appeals to a higher authority, who is the Lord. This is the Lord's work, he says, that we are doing and no one can stop his servants from carrying it out. So many good works are never finished because the leaders don't expect opposition or they don't respond firmly to it when it comes. God has called me to do this thing. That's why I will continue to do it. We're doing God's work. That's why we continue to do it despite the, despite the obstacles. Of course, we know the end of this, this part of the, the story. There's a, an incredible uh, construction feat to build a wall that is high, as high as a house, roughly 40 feet high, with a thickness that would enable a person to walk on the wall around on the top. Uh, apparently the wall was eight feet, eight feet thick, 40 feet high, eight feet uh, thick, complete with a series of massive doors and 34 watchtowers. It had 34 watchtowers and it had 10 gates surrounding the city uh, of two and a half miles. The, the wall was two and a half miles long and it contained uh, 220, um, 220 acres. So this is a map, a rendition of Nehemiah's wall. There are other walls at other times, but this is Nehemiah's wall at that time. And uh, there were gates around them. And I thought it might be interesting to take a moment and uh, kind of uh, name each of the gates and why they were named that way. We hear about this all the time. So if you look in the top left corner there, uh, it begins with the, um, with the sheep gate. Uh, the sheep gate. And why do they call it the sheep gate? Because the animals for sacrifice were brought through this gate. Uh, it was uh, close to the sheep pool where animals were washed before they were sacrificed. 
It was also near the pool of Bethesda. And we know about the pool of Bethesda, Jesus healed a lame man uh, in John chapter five, uh, verses two to 17. You know, it had been over 30 years and he wanted to go in when the water was stirred and he couldn't make it because there was always somebody ahead of him and Jesus heals him. Some of the research I did uh, uh, noticed that that particular pool was used by a, a pagan. It was a pagan idea, a pagan pool that were used uh, for different pagan uh, religions. Uh, and that idea of uh, someone stirring the water wasn't a Jewish idea. It wasn't something you know, in, the, in the law. It was a, it was a fable. It was a, uh, uh, something uh, that had been uh, handed down uh, uh, from uh, the pagan uh, nations. Anyways, the next gate is the, uh, the fish gate. If you just go down, the fish gate. Uh, this was the main entrance uh, and merchants brought fish from Tyre and the Sea of Galilee through this gate. Remember, you're not in the temple area here, you're just in the city. And so the merchants would come through the fish gate and they would sell fish. Uh, the old gate, uh, or uh, sometimes called the corner gate, this was the entrance uh, to the old city. The old city, which was uh, at the, um, uh, on the west side there. It's uh, the top is east and the bottom is west in this particular uh, picture here. The next gate was the valley gate, the valley gate, or the, uh, which was on the western side. Um, this is where the western wall was uh, located. Uh, Nehemiah began and ended his secret inspection of the ruined walls from this location. He started at the valley gate and he made his way around all the way back to the uh, valley gate. The next gate uh, I've always wondered about was the dung, the dung gate, what a name. The dung gate, that was this, on the south side. Uh, and the reason that it was called that is that uh, the road there that led to this gate was a road that led to the Hinnon Valley, which was south of Jerusalem. And this was the place where refuse uh, was dumped. It was the city dump, if you wish. Uh, sometimes uh, dead bodies were thrown there. Uh, and that's why it was called the, the Dung Gate. The next gate was the Fountain Gate. It was near the Pool of Siloam. Uh, Jesus uh, heals or sends a blind man there, right, to wash his eyes, to regain his sight in John chapter nine, verse four. It's also where the Gion spring water emerged. And so it was called the Fountain Gate. The next gate was called the Water Gate, uh, not Watergate, as in uh, President Nixon, but the Water Gate. It was, it was part of the uh, palace and temple complex, and it led to the city's main water source, which was the Gion Spring, okay? And then you had the Horse Gate. Well, why did they call it the Horse Gate? It was because that's where the horses entered. If you had a, uh, a wagon or something that was you know, pulled by a horse, or you, if you were riding a horse, this is the gate that you would use to come in. And uh, this is where the stables uh, were uh, located um, uh, and, and kept, where horses were, uh, were uh, stationed. And then you have the east gate, the east gate. People entered the temple area through this gate also called the Golden Gate. It's uh, the gate that's visible from the Mount of Olives. So the Mount of Olives is, I'm gonna turn this way, the Mount of Olives is that way, okay? Is east, is up this way. And so the Mount of Olives and the uh, Garden of Gethsemane is, if, is about a mile and a half. Uh, uh, see, so once you go out the east gate, you, you go down into the valley and then go up again. And when you get to the top, at the top, that road leads to Bethany. Lazarus, Mary, Martha are there. And just on the corner there of, of when you get up, to the, up, to, up that hill, up the valley on the other side, uh, on, on your left, on, on the right, the, the way I'm standing, is the Garden of Gethsemane. So if you come out of the Garden of Gethsemane and just stand there, you will see the, the wall you know, of Jerusalem, and you'll see the east gate, the golden gate. 
Now in the middle uh, centuries, uh, when the uh, um, uh, Muslims uh, controlled this, uh, they um, uh, believed uh, that the Messiah, the Christian Messiah would return uh, to Israel, would return to Jerusalem. And when he would return to Jerusalem, he would come into the city through the East Gate, the Golden Gate. So what they did is they bricked up the gate. They bricked up the gate and they planted a cemetery in front of the East Gate, you know, dead bones. In other words, they desecrated the ground. They desecrated the ground and they blocked the, the, the entryway of the East Gate thinking this would stop the Messiah from entering and coming back to his uh, city. Uh, we know that's incorrect 50 different ways, but anyways, if you ever see a picture of the East Gate, you'll see that it, it's, all, it's all bricked up. And then one more gate is the muster, muster Gate, not a name for it, is the Inspection Gate. And this is the gate where the city elders sat. You know, you always hear about the elders sitting at the city gate. Well, Jerusalem was rather a large city for that time. And the elders, in, there weren't elders at every gate, but they were at the muster gate or the inspection gate where they sat and where they judged uh, various uh, affairs and uh, uh, problems that the people uh, brought to them. And so uh, we know the end, as I say, uh, incredible construction, 52 days they complete rebuilding the wall, the gates, as well as the 34 watchtowers. Um, and so God called Nehemiah to perform a task and from uh, his experience, we not only see how Nehemiah responded and worked, we also see what God provides to those he calls for service. All right, so that's our lesson for uh, today. Uh, next uh, lesson, the final lesson in this series, um, we'll be finishing the story of Ezra and Nehemiah uh, and uh, we'll uh, see what God provides uh, when he calls on someone uh, to, um, uh, to do some work for him. I believe that's it all the time. I heard the bell go. We are dismissed. Thank you for your attention.